Okay, we're gonna resume open session. Uh, there are four working groups of council and one of the requirements is that the working groups have to give a report to the full council at least one time per year. So Terry Manolio is gonna give the report from the Genomic Medicine Working Group. Great, thank you. Um, so on, on behalf of the Genomic Medicine Working Group, I'm happy to give you an annual update. This is the group, um, and you can see them here. I believe, I, I trust I can be heard. Um, and I would just note that our current uh, council member and, and member of the Genomic Medicine Working Group is Pat DeVerka, and I'll ask her to comment when, when I finish. Uh, we do have a new member since um, uh, we presented to you last, and that's Gail Jarvik from the University of Washington. Uh, reminding you of the charge, they assist, in, assist you, actually, in advising NHGRI on research needed to evaluate and implement genomic medicine. Um, particularly looking at current progress and identifying research gaps, uh, identifying and publicizing key advances, uh, planning the series of genomic medicine meetings. We're up to number 13. We were thinking we might skip that one, but we'll go ahead and do it um, on timely themes, um, facilitating collaborations, and then exploring models for long-term infrastructure for uh, implementation. Um, once a month, we meet by conference call, and one of the uh, significant points of our meetings is to Excellent. So one, one of the uh, significant portions of our meetings is to review uh, a series of papers that are pulled out by our um, uh, program analyst, Cecilia Tamburo. Um, and what we do is, is try and determine are these things that should be then posted on the Genomic Medicine Working Group uh, website. So, uh, and you can see here um, what, we, what we pull out uh, just as a couple of examples, disease-based findings in November. We had um, rare genetic variants associated with sudden cardiac death. Uh, and the, there's a link to the, um, the PubMed um, uh, uh, entry for that. And then the, uh, uh, earlier we had genomic risk prediction of coronary artery disease. Again, uh, links provided to those. Um, we do this for disease-based findings. We kind of divide these things up, pharmacogenomics, clinical implementation, sequencing, oncology, uh, professional guidelines and policy. And we met last week, and we're talking about maybe a little bit of reorientation of some of these categories. But uh, that's the way they're currently posted, and um, we welcome people who are looking for uh, timely papers in, this, in the field uh, to go there and, and pull them out. Um, I think uh, Eric also mentioned um, uh, Pat DeVerka's idea about a year ago. She said, wouldn't it be cool if we actually pulled out some of these and, and kind of picked our top 10 for the year? Uh, so we did that. Amer the American Journal of Human Genetics is very generous in being willing to publish this. Uh, we, um, and there she is again. Uh, we used criteria of involving uh, the use of patients' individual genetic variant information in clinical decision making, uh, demonstrating impact of direct clinical implementation that are likely to be generalizable and have implications for healthcare systems or practice guidelines, and then also of sufficient size to be robust and broadly representative of the field. We wanted to be sure we weren't focusing just on the U.S. or just on NHGRI programs. Um, and uh, we did a little characterization or categorization of the, uh, the papers that had been published just in the past year just to show you where they, they seem to be um, falling. And you can see there are the, most of them are in clinical implementation. These uh, in blue here indicate the, uh, the 10 that were pulled out for the, the kind of top 10, and then you can see the, uh, the others. Um, so if you think you have a paper, uh, either your work or someone else's, that you think should be considered for notable accomplishments, it's always very helpful for us to have those called out. So please send us a nomination, gmwg at nih.gov. Um, we also uh, published a series on, in genomic, on genomic medicine in the Lancet. Uh, this came out in August, and you can see a series of them here. We are, of course, dwarfed by the 10 or so that came out from Columbia and many more that are, that are coming. But uh, so hats off to you. But uh, we did our own little, little effort in this. And we've told you before about the genomic medicine meetings that the group organizes. Uh, we started off with about one meeting every six months and, and have uh, since um, uh, 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 scaled that back a little bit as, as progress Congress has continued and staff have gotten exhausted um, to, to move to about once per year. Uh, our most recent one was the GM12 on genomics and risk prediction. And just to comment a bit on some of the outgrowths of these meetings, so that the very first was held very shortly after our strategic plan was published, uh, saying that we actually were going to go from, from base pairs to bedside. And from that, we had a, a, a meeting, the Clin Action Meeting, which was actually sort of the, the germinal center of the, uh, uh, the ClinGen Consortium. So it came uh, from 
out, out from that. Uh, the Genome Connect registry is a way for patients to actually provide their own um, uh, DNA uh, sequencing results with uh, full consent, et cetera, uh, for, for public use. Um, and uh, recently that was recognized by the FDA as part of its precision FDA database. So we consider that a very positive effort as well as the um, uh, pharmacogenetic component of eMERGE was added back in 2011 uh, directly uh, coming out of this, uh, this meeting. Our second meeting uh, was focused on collaborations and it led to the IGNITE program that you've heard about uh, multiple times. We had a third meeting uh, focused on payers. Um, initially we ran into a bit of a brick wall there. Uh, we think we're seeing a little bit more daylight uh, with them, and, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about that, um, not only with uh, United Healthcare, which has, has really stepped up to, uh, to show an in, in this area, but also with employers. Uh, our fourth meeting was on education, and we formed a, a um, um, coordinating committee of uh, professional societies interested in um, uh, education of practitioners at all levels. Um, our fifth meeting was on federal strategies, and we developed some, some partnerships with uh, Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services. Sixth meeting on global um, implementation, and uh, identified a number of really very exciting uh, implementation uh, projects going on around the world um, in smaller and nimbler healthcare systems. Um, and from that, uh, built the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative, which is now an international effort to bring those um, uh, implementation efforts together, working with the GA4GH. Uh, from that, we uh, had a, a follow-on meeting on Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, SJS10, um, which was a highlight of the, the uh, uh, sixth meeting because we, we learned that there were very effective programs in Southeast Asia um, to reduce the incidence of this based on, on genetic testing, and we wanted to see how we could um, uh, explore that in, in other parts of the world. Uh, and from that, uh, we, we then uh, developed a program announcement on serious adverse drug reactions. We also uh, developed a, a summit of uh, large-scale cohorts, including the All of Us Research Program, the UK Biobank, the Million Veterans Program, and a number of other um, large cohort studies around the world. Uh, and that has now become an, uh, a collaboration of 100,000 uh, plus um, cohorts. So our seventh meeting was on genomic clinical decision support, and we partnered with the National Academy of Sciences in their digitized consortium. Uh, our eighth meeting looked at sort of an overview of all of our programs, but one thing that came out was the, the very active effort from uh, Health Education England as part of Genomics England uh, in developing educational materials, and so we've developed a partnership with them. On that, uh, the ninth meeting was to, to bring back together um, basic scientists and clinicians and try to take things from the, the bedside back to the bench. Uh, and that led to um, our, our successful variant function and disease uh, program here. Um, our 10th meeting was in pharmacogenomics. We invited somebody from Optum um, to participate who was very active and got others uh, at, at Optum and United Healthcare, their parent group, uh, involved. And we now have a, a very active ongoing dialogue um, and hopefully uh, plans for some collaboration built around the Undiagnosed Disease Network as well as um, um, uh, sequencing in critically ill newborns uh, working with United Healthcare. And one thing that they, they did, they um, sort of uh, developed, whoops, sorry. Um, they developed a, a collaboration with the Genetic Testing Registry to actually use GTR test codes uh, as a more precise way of identifying and billing for genetic tests as opposed to the 200-some the CPT codes that are currently available. Um, they've piloted this and they'll be uh, publishing their results soon. Um, our 11th meeting was um, uh, focused on implementation, but led directly to, as, as part of that meeting, uh, the suggestion for a, a panel that um, Pat led on, uh, on sort of how employers are, are looking at, at genetic testing. We then follow that up with a, uh, uh, an interaction and a meeting with uh, a group of employers who are more in the healthcare setting than, than not, but there are some that also are, are, you know, the Kentucky Teachers Retirement System and, and others that are beginning to use genetics in their wellness programs, and uh, uh, we're pursuing that in a, um, uh, a follow-on program that, uh, that Pat is leading. Uh, and then our 12th program I mentioned was, uh, was focused on risk. And uh, we've also um, been lucky enough to be able to, to publish some, um, uh, some of the output of those meetings, as you can see here, uh, from our first meeting, our second, uh, this was the fourth, I believe, um, the sixth and the ninth um, and 10th. So, um, so it's, it's really been uh, quite an, an, I think, an effective working group, and we're just delighted that uh, the people that are on it are willing to put as much work into it and time as they, as they do. 
I would mention, as I have before, that these meetings are all webcast and live streamed, um, and they are available on our website. First one, because we didn't know that at the, at the time that the first one was going to sort of become a thing. Uh, but since then, our, our very um, uh, good communications group is, is now uh, involved in, in webcasting all of these. Uh, you can see a, a list of them here, um, and if you click on them uh, on any one meeting, you'll find the executive summary and meeting summary prepared by our, our program analysts, um, and then um, the video and slides are, are all available. So all of those, those materials are available for you. Uh, our 12th meeting had, had the objectives of reviewing the state of science with polygenic risk scores and how to improve it, um, looking for other information sources that should be integrated with genomic risk information in uh, genomic variant information and predicting risk. And then, as always, identifying research directions in the development, in this case, and implementation of genomic risk prediction. There were a number of recommendations from that meeting, and those are listed in the executive summary and the main meeting summary, including um, uh, research that should be done, how to accelerate adoption of evidence-based risk prediction, um, uh, looking at how to communicate risk not only to patients but to clinicians, um, uh, prioritizing validating existing PRS in diverse populations because so little work has been done in those populations, recognizing the differences among them. Um, finding ways to incorporate them into existing risk estimation tools so that they might be more rap rapidly and readily uh, adopted by professional uh, society's guidelines, and uh, measuring process outcomes and intermediate phenotypes, recognizing that, uh, that sometimes it's going to take a little bit too long for the clinical outcomes to occur, but we can still learn some useful things uh, from that. We believe that uh, most of these recommendations will at least in part be addressed by the eMERGE program that you'll hear more about uh, tomorrow, um, which is, is designed to use electronic medical records to develop, evaluate, and disseminate genomic risk assessments, so uh, sort of right up, up that alley. Um, further recommendations included investigating methods, and we heard this um, when we discussed genomic risk uh, assessment uh, in the council back a year or so ago, uh, investigating, or back to actually in, in September, um, for integrating other omic data, uh, prioritizing investigation of diseases with existing data, uh, investigating how PRS can further stratify risk of developing disease in patients with monogenic diseases, something that hasn't been done quite so much, although it's beginning to be, um, and then developing um, uh, risk scores for specific disease subtypes as opposed to kind of a one-size-fits-all. Um, and we believe that the, the notice on development of statistical population genetics and computational methods related to polygenic uh, prediction of health and disease in diverse populations, or the notice that went out um, this, uh, earlier this year, uh, encourages investigation into these uh, aspects and, and really will be addressing many of these recommendations. Uh, we also held a panel on, you know, how one goes about doing studies, either observational or clinical trials of polygenic risk prediction, and we were strongly urged, probably because we're the, the OMIC Institute, we were strongly urged uh, to capture a breadth of diseases, not to focus on a single one or a single type, um, and so look at, a, at a, a wide range of disease incidents, of risk variants, risk magnitudes across different ancestries. Uh, different age, uh, ages of onset, um, potentially optimal ages for intervention, uh, strengths of the environmental component will vary across uh, genetic conditions, the genetic architecture, there are just a few genes or very many, um, uh, the uh, uh, burden and invasiveness of the intervention, uh, implementation models that might be used, and, and availability of hard endpoints. So those are all things that we would like to consider as we do. Uh, work in this area, and particularly uh, if one takes a whole genome approach to this, we would hope to, uh, to be able to cover a broad range of conditions. We will go forward with a, with a 13th meeting, um, and that will be in, in June, Genomics and Public Health. Uh, we thought it might be timely to at least to ask the question, what research needs to be done in order to move this into public health? And maybe it shouldn't be moved, but, um, but there are some, there's already some movement in that direction. So, um, so at least let's sort of find out from a bunch of smart people um, things like, you know, what's the landscape of genomic medicine that's being applied to population and public health in the U.S.? There is some that's going on, um, largely supported by either the CDC or the Health Resource Services Administration, HRSA, um, and uh, uh, public health models that might be informative, and then looking at the barriers, particularly in reaching out to underserved communities and how to get them on an equal footing, and defining a research, uh, research agenda to build on these efforts. So that will be this June, and again, it will be webcast and live streamed.
And then lastly, I'd just like to review for you briefly our, our portfolio. Um, you've heard about many of these programs. Um, I would note the Insight program uh, actually ended, the funding for it ended in 2018. Uh, they were a very enthusiastic group of investigators, and so they continued to, um, and, uh, and actually finished up uh, last September or so. Um, and from that, we learned that, you know, very useful lessons in terms of the use of sequencing in the, in the newborn period in the neonatal intensive care unit and in other settings. Um, the CSER program you heard earlier uh, will be uh, ending in fiscal 20, um, so that's the, its current phase is, is uh, uh, sort of winding up. We may extend it by a year just to, to be sure that they're able to have an orderly closeout. Um, and the reason for that is that uh, sequencing really has gotten into the clinical realm, and so there isn't as much of a need for a consortium, a top-down uh, driven approach to, to sort of get it there. But there's still a host of questions to be asked and answered, and we feel that will be more suitably uh, addressed in individual uh, R01 type, type research. And then the UDN, which is a common fund um, supported program, although we, we manage it, um, it will be sunsetting in fiscal 22, so it has another two years to run. And I should mention as well, the Insight program was, uh, was split 50-50 with our, our NICHD colleagues, and we're continuing uh, that collaboration with the DGTEX program that you heard about. Um, the Emerge, Ignite, and ClinSeq program, uh, ClinGen programs, um, you've heard mentioned uh, multiple times, and we'll hear a little bit more about Emerge uh, tomorrow, but I would note as well that uh, with the concept that you heard on investigator-initiated awards, we really are uh, trying to reach out to get people to, to come into this field, uh, particularly new folks, folks who haven't been involved in it previously in, in any of our large consortia, but everyone will be, will be welcome to apply to that. Uh, and then our, our training efforts, um, we do want to expand those and, and bring, again, uh, more investigators into this field. So I think with that, I'll stop and ask Pat if you'd like to make any other comments about the, the working group. Well, let me just first say, Could you use your microphone? Well, I just wanted to first point out that um, it's a very productive working group, and um, that's really due to Terry's great leadership and her fantastic staff. So she mentioned Cecilia Tamburo and Rob Rowley, and we really couldn't do it without them. And it's really your leadership, Terry. Um, and then I think the only other thing is just to emphasize that, um, you know, implementation where we're really focused requires partnerships. And so it's not just about the academic partnerships um, or even the international partnerships, um, but partnerships with groups that are um, based in industry. So she mentioned Optum. I'm doing a project with employers. Uh, and just really um, hearing how they view genomics um, from their perspective, very, very different than the kinds of conversations that we're having here. And so I think it's, you know, we I kind of see us as like being bilingual. We can speak genomics, but we can speak, um, you know, plain language. And I think that's really important for people to understand sort of what is the opportunity for genomics, for example, to have an impact in employee wellness programs. Is, is this the right time? Um, so, and, you know, also being very externally facing tracking developments like the FDA's position on pharmacogenomics, very important in terms of thinking how we're going to implement. And then finally, just the importance of raising awareness of what we're doing. And I think the year in review, but um, the website, and we really do encourage all of you to send articles in. We're taking that process very seriously. And I think the more we can do um, to have Eric um, have it on his social media account or any other links is really critically important because we really are, I think, in an inflection point where we can tangibly demonstrate the impact that genomics is having on clinical care. So it's an exciting time. Great. Thank you, Pat. Other comments or questions? Okay. Thank you very much, Terry.